Okay, can I welcome Ananya Bhattacharya to our stage now? Um, a social entrepreneur, one of her many roles is with Bangla Tak, a social enterprise which works across India with a mission to foster pro-poor growth and protection of rights of women, children and indigenous communities. And today she will outline the experience with Bangla Tak in the context of ICH. My presentation. Namaste and a very good afternoon to all of you. I'm Ananya from Calcutta in India and I thank Majorne and Museum Gallery Scotland for giving me the opportunity to share our experience in this beautiful symposium. Um, what uh, I'll uh, focus on is uh, more on the sustainable development angle and also touch on human rights and identities which are the key themes. Now, we have been talking about development and as you see in the even declaration, right from the beginning, there has been a focus on participation. And thankfully, since maybe since 90s, there has been a shift in the development paradigm. So from an investment in infrastructure, from a focus on, you know, uh, on a, a focus on a forced down approach, it has been changed to values and it has been changing to participation. So development paradigm has been shifting. And intangible cultural heritage offers new opportunities. So what I'll do in the next few minutes is I'll share the experiences we have related to culture and development and the working models which have been tested out and we have been working with and how it has impacted identity and rights issues. To give you a background, our organization is a social enterprise. So we came here from a development perspective. So we work for equitable development. And what we found is that in India, we have these indigenous communities who have a rich heritage of performing arts, oral traditions, traditional craftsmanship, knowledge of nature, which are not recognized in the formal developmental paradigms. So what happens is a singer who might be knowing 500 songs and singing stories with philosophies on human relations is treated as uneducated because he's illiterate. So our initiative is known as Art for Life, where we targeted developing sustainable livelihood options out of the art skills in the communities. And we started with 3,000 folk artists in Eastern India, in the state of West Bengal. And today we have covered more than 10,000 families in the two Eastern Indian states of Bihar and West Bengal. So you see, we have been working for now 10 years, and th that's from where our, my experiences are from. Now, if we talk of economics and production, we, what we say, production is factored by land, labor, and capital. Now, intangible cultural heritage relates very well to this. See, our heritage, as we have already discussed and the previous speakers have mentioned, it's very much determined by the place where we are living in, right? It's just as natural resources are part of land. Our cultural resources are also defined by the place where we are living and leading our lives. And capital... In the conventional sense, capital, we talk about the tools and the machineries where investments are needed. But here, capital is the cultural wealth which is there in the embedded in the skills of the communities. And the people, they themselves are the practitioners, so they are the level. And the fourth factor is entrepreneurship. It's a successful entrepreneur who manages the land, labor, and capital to build enterprise, right? So here also, cultural entrepreneurship or creative industries, they have the potential. They have the potential to use this resource, which is not used really in many places that way, to develop new areas of enterprise addressing issues of socioeconomic empowerment of people. So off to some examples. Now, this is a village. I don't know whether you can see it clearly. But there are some metal crafts in the front. It's a lost wax method, which is a very old method. You know, gypsies or roaming communities, they had that. So what they do 
is they made, make a mold of wax and they pour metal, molten metal in it. And you, traditionally they used to meet, make grain measures and anklets and things like that. This craft is known as Dokra in India. And these nomadic tribes have now settled down and they're extremely poor. So this village is one of 50 families. And even two years back, you know, that village was known as the village of the drunkards. Because these people, they used to make the Dokra craft and it, it involves, you know, working in the furnace. So they had to withstand that heat. And uh, end of the day, they used to drink. The women were not literate and no one went to the village. So there was really no respect for the craftspersons. The Dokra is a much coveted and much uh, internationally publicized craft of India. So what happened in the last two years we have been working, we focused on those issues also on the issues of, you know, women empowerment, getting them involved on the issues of stopping alcoholism. And today, you know, just last month, the village for the first time held a festival where people came and many people from the surrounding places entered the village for the first time. And they said, even a doctor, a local doctor, he said, you know, I come here always to you know, save the people from, you know, dying conditions and you have changed the village. So their craft led to the change only what was different, previously they were working as wage laborers. Dokra was being made for the last decades, many, many decades, but no one was giving respect to the craftsperson. So that's where we have to be very conscious in our approaches, in our policies, that you know, the human rights is also all about human respect, and that is often what goes missing. So, from the 3,000 artists we started with, when we started, in terms of Indian rupee, they did not even earn 500 Indian rupee, which is like, uh, you can say, five pounds a month. Today, the average income in pounds will be like 40, while with 10% of them, they're earning more than 150 pounds a month. So their income has increased many fold. But that is not the only thing. The main thing is they're enjoying the respect and recognition. I'm not sure whether you can read the impacts, but what has happened is not only economic improvement, but they are now more interested to participate in the local development process. Previously, they were alienated from the development process. Now they're asking for roads, they're asking for electricity, they're, uh, they're sending their children for education to school. There is greater value of education. In Indian, many discourses, often it is said that these marginalized communities, they're uneducatable and unemployable. Why? Because the parents don't have a value for the children's education, they won't send children to school, and they don't have the skills to employ them. So that has been the shift which our effort has brought over. So there is the, all the children in these families where we work, it's, I'm talking of 10,000 families today, they're going to school, the people have installed toilets at home. India, as you may be aware, 60% of Indians still difficult in the open. It's a national shame for us. But they learn the value of sanitation through the process. And in one of the other villages where they make terracotta, when we started two years back, there were 90% houses were without toilets. And today, all the houses have toilets. So we never told them to install a toilet at home. But you know, the cult, with their culture, when we opened up the world to them through exhibitions, through festivals, through participation in different events, they learned about the world. As people appreciated their art, they also started, their self-esteem, their self-respect improved. And you know what happened in the end result? They started appreciating the developmental goals too. So there is improved sanitation, there is improved quality of life, and as you know, most of the traditional bearers are women. And these women, who are in many cases, they were restricted to go out of the house. And now they're traveling to Europe, they're traveling to various places in Asia, showcasing their art form. So gender mobility has come. One of, you know, Indian embroidery is famous. So one of the embroidery styles we were working with, women did not again earn more than five pounds a month. It's called kantha, it's a run stitch, it's a quilting technique, it's a wonderful embroidery. And on an average, uh, um, maybe a stole will cost around 5,000, which is like a 50 pounds, but they earn peanuts. So what we started there is, we started their teaching about business process and 
In that business process, we gave them the knowledge and the confidence to work as an enterprise, to source their material, to go to the bank. We even taught how to go and talk to the bankers. We used theater because these women were not educated. So we used Bangla is Bengal and Natak is theater. So we used theater for life skill development. And so today these women, their income has again increased from 500 to 5,000 rupees a month only within two years. So poverty is really not a lack of skill here. What was poverty here? The lack of opportunities. And building on intangible cultural heritage opened up that opportunity. Now, one thing I'd like to mention from our learning, livelihood is really not equal to additional income generation only. It is our income is, of course, important. But what is more important is engagement. So when we are talking of developing sustainable livelihood create, or creative industries out of ICH, this is something which is very important to remember. We worked with traditional storytellers who paint long scrolls with natural color and sing them. And we had a partnership with London Metropolitan University. And those students, when they went in, they found that they were just using poster and acrylic colors. So what they did is they sat with the families, and there were only two, three persons at time who remembered how the natural colors were met, and they documented all that. And the community, again, started using it. And the beauty of natural color is, as the scrolls grow older, they become brighter. Okay, so that got revived. This dance form is Chow Dance. It's inscribed in the UNESCO representative list. It's a very vigorous acrobatic dance, and it's a male dance. What happened? Chow Dance got revived. The Chow Dancers were going everywhere, and the young girls in the villages, they said, we'll also dance. And today, there are two women Chow Dance teams. So, you know, we are talking about how to engage the young people, or how to get their interest. Once we develop this, it's not about income here, but it's about aspirations. So the young people find new uh, that I can become an artist, I can become a star. So that aspiration drives it. So it's not always the income factor. Bangla, Kowali, and Potirgan, these are some of the documentations. Today, uh, two speakers shared about participatory inventory. Now, what had happened to the Chow dance, for example, it was acrobatic, and they forgot the original dances, and just the jumping remained. Then the older dancers, they sat with the community, with the documenting specialists, and they documented the older steps. Then the skill development workshops were held, and you know, they emulate the movement of snake, they emulate the movement of monkey, all those styles were lost, so those were brought back. The storytelling songs were documented, Kawali, most of you may have heard of Kawali. It's a group singing, and there was a form called Bengali Kawali, which is in Bangladesh, West Bengal area. Now, the <coughs> fakirs who sing this, they are the Sufis of Bengal, they are very ostracized because they don't follow the conventional notions of Islam. They're followers of Islam, but they don't ascribe to the conventional pathways, so they're ostracized. Their children were not allowed to school, they were not allowed to sing together, so Kawali was lost. Now, in this revival process, they again started singing Kawali because they could again assemble together, as uh, Janet very rightly pointed out, often they don't even have the scope of assembling together. So when they got that opportunity, they again revived the Kawali, and the whole thing was documented. So these are the examples where, you know, the impact is the youth got engaged, the art form got revived, the lost traditions were revived. So these were the effects. So what our surmise or learning is that culture, ICH, needs investment because that skill, as I explained in that land, labor, capital and enterprise theory, it leads to resource generation in the community for new developments. And that's where, you know, what was just a dance or an oral tradition or a craft creates resource for the entire community to develop. So often we say that will there be a conflict if one group goes forward. Say if there is cultural tourism, then there is a sharing of benefits. The women, the disabled, the young people, they have other income opportunities from the hospitality services. 
Then, as their identity gets strengthened, as they understand that my culture is being respected and recognized, what happens? They start taking interest in the development process, which has an impact on the achievement of the sustainable development goals. And of course, once that pride comes in, the interest to safeguard, the interest to participate, that also comes in. So we see that, you know, what is the role here of ICH? It helps to create an enabling ecosystem for sustainable development. Museums play a very important role here. What we have done in this process, we have set up almost 10 what we call resource centers, art resource centers, but these are what we can say community museums or living museums, which provide the community a valuable space to practice and to learn. So this is where it is strengthening transmission, where people from outside are going. So you see there are various, one is dance, this is song, that is the scroll painting resource center, and in the, these two are the oldest, and every weekend now there are visitors to the village of the scroll painters. And the painters say, you know, the children, every Saturday morning, they will sit down with their crayons and paper, saying that someone will come and they will see us painting. So see, the children are also taking pride in their art form. And so it has become a very important, the museums are important for transmission, for creating an identity, creating a brand for the village, and of course, you know, setting that very impactful cycle. I'll just take you on a tour. So this is the Patachitra Museum. We got EU fund to set up the initial ones and now the government in our state, they have uh, put it in their policy. So they're building them in the villages where there are 50 or 100 families practicing art form. So this is uh, Baul Fakiri. So what has happened, we have developed a calendar of festivals. It's a fixed calendar. So in some villages, it's now in the sixth year, in some it's in the second year. I've left some brochures with a calendar and I invite all of you. The festivals are between November and March. Every weekend, one village has a festival. So what we found, you will see how the everyone, the children, the women, everyone is involved. And we found that even the local people were not aware of the art form. And through the festivals, local awareness, local recognition got created. So identity is at individual level, is at a local, national and international level. This festival, we had someone from Colombia and I asked, how did you learn about it? He said, I, uh, I heard from someone in Europe. So you see, that's how powerful today's ICT is. We have a festival, Holi you must be knowing, is a festival of colors. So there were three persons from Malaysia last year. So I said, how did you know about this? They said, it's called the best folk holy in India. So you see, it's a very organic system this ICT provides through which awareness gets created. So festivals are extremely important. One, it gives a context for renewal performance. It might be dying. Say, for example, we have a mass dance tradition. And maybe just two years back, we found five, or not even five groups were there and it was a dying heritage. We were working on the craft of the mask tradition. Then in this festival, that dance also got revived, and people go. So you see it is providing a new context, and as I said, it creates a brand, and the larger community is impacted. The other thing we have been discussing today is accepting the other, whose heritage? Who decides what's the heritage? Huh. I was looking for you. <laughs> that I have to see the time. Yeah. Huh. So, yeah. So there also festivals play a very important role. We have a festival called Sufi Sutra, which is a peace music festival. This is in the sixth year. And I'm happy to share that Cherry Grove from Scotland will be performing in the festival next year. The, as the people, they go abroad, or the people from outside come in, they build their own networks. And not only the confidence part and the self-esteem part, but what happens is innovations as they interact. That's why, you know, in our policies, we should have exchange and collaboration put in, because that creates new innovations. ICH is threatened, it's very fragile. But, you know, once we open up the world, 
Why is it fragile? Because they've been cut out, shut out from the modern globalized development. So that kind of uh, reinforces the thing. So this is a very small clip where it shows a team from Wales and the team, the Baul and Fakirs, they are kind of performing together. So this is the resource center where these music teams, they just find their way. So in conclusion, what I'd like to say is that the two areas I think such knowledge forums and networking is important. One is to build evidence because we know as a sustainable development goals have been announced and culture is there and not there. It could have been more explicit, but it's not that explicit. So maybe we need to build evidence and there all of us, academics, NGOs, communities need to work together. The other is the legal framework part. I think a lot is missing there. We have laws to protect our collections, laws to protect our built heritage, but really not enough laws for the intangible. I think these are the two areas where we'd like to really work together and develop. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ananya. So hold some of those thoughts and a, a quick the coastal rowing communities.